Good day to everyone joining us on the Zoom platform and welcome to Shifting to Sustainable Healthy Diets, a dialogue ahead of the Global World Food Systems Summit conceptualized by the UWE SDA Faculty of Food and Agriculture and the FAN project exploring the roles of the food system actors, community perspectives, and the demand for healthy local and sustainable food products and services from across the region. Colleagues, we are here because the region is facing a serious public health food related issue. The Caribbean Public Health Agency warned of obesity levels in CARICOM countries that they are highest compared to the rest of the world and alarmingly very high among our youth, which puts them at particular risk for non-communicable diseases. My name is Dr. Gaya Sidoxi, Deputy Dean Outreach and Internationalization from the Faculty of Food and Agriculture, moderator for today's session. The objectives of this particular webinar are to focus on solutions considering public health and the importance of healthy diets and nutrition to overall health and wellness compounded by COVID-19, to understand the prerequisites to solutions to overcome known difficulties in transitioning from unhealthy to healthy foods, to identify the role currently played by private sector actors in producing, distributing, and marketing local healthy foods, and to showcase healthy, local, and sustainable food products and services from across the region. Just before we get into our main elements, just tell you a little bit about our logistics for the session today. So participants, please note that you will be restricted in your communication through the use of the chat and Q&A icons that are to the bottom of your Zoom screen. For general comments, we ask that you please use the chat function while questions to the panel should be directed through the Q&A icon yeah, and that particular window. We have a dedicated period towards the end of the session to respond to all your questions, comments, and concerns. So please, you are encouraged to be very, very interactive. We have an inclusive roster of panelists that I know will keep you engaged throughout this entire program. Just prior to our technical presentations, we will be honored by having some opening remarks from our host institution. The first item on our agenda, I would like to invite Professor Wayne Ganpa, Dean, of the Faculty of Food and Agriculture to offer some opening remarks. Professor Ganpat, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chair, Dr. Gia Sidopsi, Deputy Dean of Greece in the Faculty of Food and Agriculture, uh, Professor Anika Samuels, I acknowledge you, as well as the other speakers, Mr. David Nealands, Mr. Judy White, Dr. Maruvanti, and our old colleague, Dr. Mr. Fletcher. I um, welcome you on behalf of the campus principal and on behalf of the Faculty of Food and Agriculture, which is charged with the responsibility for food and nutrition of initiatives across the region. The issue here today is very important and very important to us. We are the regions facing serious public health related issue. In March this year, the Caribbean Public Health Agency warned that obesity levels in the Caribbean, in the Caribbean countries more, moreover, are the highest compared to the rest of the world and alarmingly higher in children five to nine years old. Overweight and obesity prevalence level in children has been found to be two to three times higher than the world average, which puts them at risk for non-communicable diseases. We know the burden that puts on the health system presently and the burden it will put on the health system in the future. Only today in the Trinidad Guardian, I read someone commenting and said that 240 adults, 100,000 adults in the Caribbean die due to impacts of poor eating habits. That's an alarming statistic. I think it was coming out from the FAO representative in Jamaica. So as we celebrate 100 years of agricultural research here at the campus, 
it is important for us to address this issue. We are named a faculty of food and agriculture. I have always articulated that probably nutrition should have been added, especially in the last decade, should have been added because it has been high on the agenda. So it's something I leave the faculty with, that they need to put nutrition much higher in its name because it's so very important. And as we celebrate 100 years of agriculture at the University of the at the University of the West Indies here in Trinidad and Tobago this year, 2021, 100 years being as, after being established here at the Western Agricultural College in 1921. We are pleased to see that we have transitioned from agriculture alone to including agriculture and food in all our programs. And we really want to extend this knowledge and expertise across the region. And the other things that the faculty are doing is that we are training people, nutritionists, technicians, persons in the food service industry who enter what we are calling the age of nutrition. And Trinidad and Tobago is not our only uh, captive audience. We want to extend this to the entire region. So most of our programs, some are already online and some will be going online in the very near future, so that we can extend this knowledge across the region. We also have the MSc in Value Addition, which is titled MSc in Value Addition for Food and Nutrition Security. And it's one of my programs that I spearheaded and was named exactly that, so that we would seek some measure of nutrition, um, put some emphasis on nutrition in those programs, so that gra graduates can diversify their products, extend shelf life, et cetera, for more seasonable crops. Just give us a better chance, a better fighting chance with more local input. And one other objective of the faculty initiative really is that several PhD students are in, uh, interrogating the issue of digitalization of agriculture. And it's expected that they will, that they will provide strategies to really enhance nutrition education across the region. So today, this webinar brings a unique group of researchers, civil society, representative, private sector, and youth activists to focus on the role of the private sector and the community's perspectives and the demand for healthy, local, and sustainable food products and services from across the region. I urge you to get involved in the conversation and to generate solutions. The quality of lives in our people in the region depends on the actions we take now. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you so very much, uh, Dean Ganpat, for sharing with us uh, these opening remarks. And we just want to note uh, your emphasis on uh, the burden to our health system, as well as um, information uh, indicating uh, high death rates associated with uh, NCDs. I also wish to acknowledge your uh, input into the proactive approach taken by the FFA to support transitioning and capacity development in this critical area. Uh, kudos to the FFA. Uh, let us move on to our technical presentations uh, for our engagement this afternoon. And it is a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor uh, Alafia Samuels and Professor Samuels, a former director of the George Allen Chronic Disease Research Center, uh, UWE Barbados, is now with the Caribbean Institute for Health Research, UWE, in Jamaica. She's a medical doctor trained at UWE Mona. She also holds a master's in public health and a PhD in chronic disease epidemiology from John Hopkins University. Her career has included both working with the Ministry of Health in Jamaica delivering and managing public sector health programs for greater than 20 years and in academia at the University of the West Indies uh, for the last 10. She's a member of the PAHO Technical Advisory Group for NCDs for the Caribbean, Technical Advisor uh, to the Healthy Caribbean Coalition, Chair-elect of the NCD Child, Co-Chair of World Obesity Federation Policy and Prevention Committee, and a Lancet One Health Commissioner. Her research interests include policy, practice, and evaluation of NCD prevention and control programs and translating evidence into practice. She has more than 50 publications in peer-reviewed journals. 
He led the formal evaluation of the CARICOM Heads of Government 2007 Port of Spain Declaration on NCDs and reports annually on NCDs to the Caucus of Ministers of Health of 20 Caribbean countries. A 2016 Lancet profile dubbed her the fast food watchdog of the Caribbean. It is with great pleasure I welcome our first presenter, Professor Lafia Samuel, to share with us her presentation on private sector partners to improve healthy eating. Professor Samuels, the floor is yours. If you just unmute your mic, please, uh, Professor. Yes, thank you. I was being obedient to mute. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, and today we want to talk about um, healthy eating and as a lead into the role of the private sector in. Um, so just to give an idea of our consumption in the Caribbean compared to the rest of the world. So on the left hand side, you will see consumption by age group. So along the X axis is the ages and on the Y axis is the amount of calories. So on average, um, the world is consuming um, much less calories than the Caribbean and the colors indicate the different types of food. And I just want us to focus on the red bar, which is sugar sweetened beverages. And we can see that um, in our children at age 10, we have the highest consumption. Um, and in fact, it's, it's off the charts as they would see, sorry. Um, it was mentioned earlier about childhood obesity. This was a study done for the Commonwealth Health Ministers meeting where we looked at Commonwealth countries and in regards to small island developing states, only the Pacific islands um, are at a higher trajectory than the Caribbean. So the Caribbean is there in blue and you can see the very rapid increase in childhood obesity over the past um, decades where we were you know, around 2% and we are now about 12%. And there is a great link between food systems and high burden of NCDs. And here you see um, the Caribbean and the Pacific in terms of the rapid increase in food imports over the last decades. The Caribbean is thought to be one of the regions of the world with the highest levels of consumption of sugar sweetened beverages, um, estimated at two per day. And of course, this results in um, life in the fat lane. This is an 11 year old who weighs 190 pounds and clearly um, is obese. And the danger of obesity um, is not just aesthetic or, or you know, um, children being bullied or whatever. We also have impact on disease. So you can see here BMI category by hypertension. So um, for the obese, they are, have double the likelihood of obesity of sorry hypertension as those who are normal weight and for those people who have diabetes the obese have three times the rate of those who are normal weight the result is that we find that our main risks for death and disability and this is a jamaica figure but it's similar um, for the rest of the caribbean where our main risks are diet related so our main um, risk for death and disability. Number one is um, diabetes, which is being driven in large part by obesity and sugar sweetened beverages. Two is high body mass index obesity. Three is dietary risk. Four, high blood pressure. And high blood pressure is driven again by obesity and high salt intake. And please note that these risks have increased by 45% over the past 10 years. So we can say that unhealthy diet is a leading modifiable cause of NCD disease and premature mortality in the Caribbean, where we have a much higher percentage of our NCD deaths. In fact, 40% of our NCD deaths take place before the age of 70. Now, the relationship with the private sector is very important because the private sector feeds people, academics do not. Um, and we also need to consider that um, it's important for us to transition to a diet that's sustainable for the planet. So with our two big objectives, and this diagram is from the Lancet Eat Commission, um, 
and they conclude that food is the single strongest lever to optimize human health and environmental sustainability. So we need to do both things at the same time. The problem is that we have been transitioning to processed foods and processed foods, we look at the red bar at the bottom, ultra processed foods are our big problem. All the things that the young people are eating, the chips, the burgers, the hot dog, the cake and pastry, the sugar sweetened beverages, most breakfast cereals. We should be eating more in the green category, unprocessed and minimally processed, and um, a little bit of the yellow, of course, your, your oils that you need. Um, and then some processed foods, actually preserved foods is a better um, word for that, because yes, we need to preserve food, but the ultra processing, you can't even recognize what's in the food. There are, there are words on that label that you can't pronounce. And my thing is, if I can't pronounce the word, I shouldn't be eating it. So we have about 10 companies that control a great deal of the packaged foods in the world. Um, and a lot of the products that they have right now are ultra processed and have unhealthy foods, trans fats and so on. But there is a global movement. And I think this year's um, conference, the United Nations um, Food Conference later on, will have to address this issue of the quality of foods um, from multinational corporations. But today we are going to be talking about what has been happening in the Caribbean and um, what advances have been made. So our two private spe sector speakers later on um, will talk to us about what we have been doing. So what we need to do is to have partnerships with the private sector and we need to be reformulating. Um, we need warning labels and nutrition labels and these warning labels should be graphic front of package labels because it is the most equitable approach to labeling where everybody regardless of their educational level can easily see which foods are, um, have high rates of sugar, salts, and fats. But also we need to recognize that there is what we call the friendly private sector. Private sector making profits from selling healthy foods and our last presenter will tell us how he's doing that um, and, um, and so on. So we need to be very, um, we need to recognize that <clears throat> the private sector, there's a whole range of players in the private sector. Okay, so what should we drink? First and foremost, water, very good for you. Cheap, comes right to the pipe. In the Caribbean, we're lucky that we have water coming out of our pipe that is suitable for drinking. So remember when you buy the bottled water that the bottle is part of the environmental problem. So reusable bottles, please. So um, ad, um, this is uh, advice on the best drinks for you. So water, um, unsweetened tea and coffee, low fat milk, diet drinks. Of course, we have our coconut water that we need to put right in that mix as well. The worst thing for you to be drinking is sugar sweetened beverages because they give you lots of calories and nothing else. And sugar in drinks is much more dangerous than sugar in food. Okay, so what should we eat? Half vegetables, quarter starch, quarter good protein. Here's a nice meal ready for everybody to have. Um, we also have other things in the Caribbean. This is more Jamaica style jerk chicken. And then we have our um, steamed fish with you know, your vegetables and your boiled yam, wonderful food to eat. Okay, the, friend, the profitable and, and the friendly private sector. We have a whole range of interventions from a whole set of different private sector um, companies across the region. Um, uh, innovations that they have made in order to um, produce and market uh, foods that are more healthy and um, less harmful. So here we have some photographs of some various um, initiatives. Um, in Jamaica, we have a company called Island Grill what, that does a lot of jerked and, and grilled foods. And the nutritionists in Jamaica recommend to their um, clients, those who must eat on the road, that Island Grill is much preferable to like Kentucky or, you know, deep fat fried other places. Um, what should we drink? Again, we have our green juice, our beet juice. You have all those kind of natural drinks. Um, and <clears throat> we have also had reformulation exercises. And a good example has been the reduction of salt in bread in Barbados. 
um, and there you can see um, some of their the products that they have been able to reduce um, the salt in. Uh, and there is the package. Oh, the cassava bread, of course, is a whole nother in, um, innovation as well, um, because cassava is our own from in the Caribbean. So here are the views and the pictures of these wonderful children, Caribbean children, um, growing up that we want to, we are obliged, really. We, we have signed the Declaration on the Rights of the Child, um, and in part of that, it mandates governments to um, have environments, healthy environments for children. And healthy environments mean environments where they have access to healthy food and that we do not have marketing and sale of unhealthy ultra processed foods, either in schools or in their environments. And of course, we have to encourage um, their parents at home to also reflect um, some of this healthy eating. So thank you very much. Thank you so very much, uh, Professor Samuels, uh, for framing the context of this particular engagement and highlighting to us you know, the high consumption of processed foods and how that links to uh, an obesity burden and the likelihood of NCDs. And very importantly, there I, I pull out uh, early death. You know? So thanks for drawing that very strong relationship here and for also sharing with us uh, insights into the role uh, of the private sector, as well as consumers and the relationships that have to happen there uh, with things like appropriate labels. I was also very happy uh, to recognize regional innovations uh, in healthy foods. And I hope that that stimulates our participants and attendees uh, in regards to uh, their own uh, perspectives. So I just wanna remind them, please note that uh, the chat and Q&A functions are available and we encourage you if you do have any questions or comments uh, to use uh, those features uh, to sharing them uh, with our uh, panel. So as we move on, I will now like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Maruvani Murphy, uh, other, otherwise uh, known as Mari. Uh, Dr. Murphy is a senior lecturer in qualitative research methods at the George Allen Chronic Disease Research Center of the Caribbean Institute for Health Research and the Deputy Dean of Research and Postgraduate Studies at the Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of the West Indies, Cave Hill Campus in Barbados. Mari's area of expertise is in the use of qualitative research methods, including in-depth interviews, focus groups, and photo elicitation. Her research and publications over the last 15 years have focused on social and behavioral determinants of health, public health policy development, implementation, and evaluation in small island developing states, and also food and nutrition security intervention research throughout CARICOM. She has advised on a range of public health issues at both national and regional level. It is my pleasure to invite Dr. Murphy to do a presentation on understanding consumer food consumption in the Caribbean. Dr. Murphy, please. Hi, good afternoon and thank you. I'm really happy to be able to share some of this research and the findings that we have from one of our grants to understand consumer food consumption in the Caribbean. So just a little background in terms of what we know about food insecurity, nutrition and NCDs in the Caribbean. We know that mortality from NCDs are the highest in the Americas with four out of 10 NCD deaths under the age of 70 and those are potentially preventable. We also know that hunger and nutritional deficits coexist. And with the increase in population overweight and obesity, you know, that's been leading to some of the issues that we have, especially with NCDs. We have a global food system that's demanding more processed foods and processed meals. And we've had changes in our dietary patterns over the decades. We have a nutritional landscape that's fueled by junk food. With the fastest increase in ultra processed food and drink product sales and in overweight and obesity being in Latin America and the Caribbean. So what we did with one of our grants um, is we looked at the, to, we investigated the factors influencing consumer food sources and dietary patterns. And we did a range of focus groups, interviews. Um, we spoke with consumers, farmers, manufacturers, really from top to bottom, bottom to top um, people in the food system really to understand and to see if everyone was saying the same kinds of things, the same kinds of stories, but from different, um, from different perspectives. 
And we did these in Jamaica, St. Kitts, St. Nevis, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, I should add. So what did we find out? A lot of people said, I know better, but. So the knowledge exists about healthy versus unhealthy foods. People spoke a lot about saying, yes, we know about NCDs, we know what happens to our bodies, but consumer demand drives what's available for purchase. And accessibility is important, but affordability is the bottom line. And what we found from what everyone has been telling us is that cost and convenience override knowledge. We had, for example, um, one mother who was explaining that she had two young kids and while she knew, she knew about um, healthy foods, she knew about NCDs, all of these things, the reality for her is that she works two jobs, she has to get food home to her kids, and sometimes the, the cheap, um, you know, Chinese noodles are the fastest things to get that can fill tummies, and, you know, she said she actually feels guilty about it. So people know, and they're really trying to figure out what to do, but they're going for the cheapest option, given all the different things that are happening with us in our lifestyles right now. Children nowadays don't eat them things. This was something we heard quite a lot from parents in particular. Um, the exposure to local produce is a thing of the past, they think, and children eat what they know, and what they know is the imported fruits and vegetables. That's what they see when they go to the supermarket for their parents, for example. So we have to consider the accessibility and marketing to children as well, because that plays a very big role in what they eat. It's what they're seeing on ads, it's what they're seeing when they go out to places, it's what they're seeing that's being offered at restaurants. And the foods introduced in schools, because a lot of um, parents, for example, spoke about school feeding programs, school meal programs that offer some local, some you know, farmers to school, um, bringing vegetables in and having those cooked, for example. But the issue is if you don't have that follow through at home with children, they lose interest in eating them. So it can't be something that's just um, given in one setting. And then we have the invincibility of youth. Young adults consider themselves protected from NCDs due to their youth. They figure that they will change their diets when it becomes necessary to do so. If they have a risk factor, then they will consider that. Um, young people with spending power seek to balance health and wellness with healthy eating being one aspect of health. And I found that really interesting when we spoke to some of the, the younger adults. Um, one young man, for example, you know, said that, you know, if it's a choice between a stressful day and, and having, during a stressful day, having to buy a meal that was healthy versus going to maybe the movies with some friends to kind of de-stress, he saw it as, you know, his mental health was more important at the time than worrying about what to eat. And he will faster go do that than buy the healthy meal. Um, so, you know, trying to balance holistic health, you know, trying to, to, to figure out what makes the most sense to do in a particular situation. Food is not always the top priority. And interestingly, families rarely eat together. So Sunday lunches are the exception. Um, individual family members, including children, eat on the run. And dinner may be all from the same meal, whether it's prepared at home or whether it's um, store-bought and brought home, but everyone is eating at their convenience. And we're seeing the loss of that communal eating, um, which sometimes stands in as a check for what you're eating as well. Fast food is no longer a treat, and I ask, but should it ever have been? As a treat now means that more fast foods, and when I say fast foods, I don't only mean the big chains, I also mean what we call convenience foods, you know, a lot of these roadside vendors who are selling um, hot food, and, and those are being um, consumed in larger con quantities, particularly on weekends. Those who work in areas that we consider town areas purchase their fast food now more as the norm. And those fast foods or convenient foods are popular for persons with long commuting times to work or school, they eat en route. Interestingly, we heard about the early enforcement of eating healthy foods leading to rebellion. And we found this quite, you know, something that we hadn't really considered as much. This perception of being forced to eat fruits and vegetables as children led to adults eating them less now because now they have a choice. So many adults would not force their own children to eat items that they didn't want to eat based on their own past childhood experiences. So the psychological piece of, of eating and how food is seen, how healthy food is seen is really important in terms of how we get messaging across around healthy and nutrition, nutritious foods, because we don't want people to feel that they're being forced to eat something that they don't want to eat. And then the question kept coming up, is eating local healthier? We've been pushing a lot about eating local, but there were some concerns about things such as pesticides and other chemicals on food that's grown and produced locally. You know, are farmers, you know, using the right amounts? Are they trained enough? Um, you know, what about buying local convenient food, convenience foods? Are they seen as better? 
And even if they've seen us better, but how are they really prepared? Are they really prepared in a healthier way? And then how are meals portioned? Um, Professor Samuel showed a, a great plate in, in terms of how it should be portioned, but we all know sometimes when you get that container of food from a fast food place, it, it isn't always portioned that way. So these were some of the things and concerns that, that consumers had in particular. So what do we need to do? We really need to create consumer demand for nutritious options. We have to engage convenience food providers to prepare nutritious options that are appropriately portioned. We have to consider making the cost of local unprocessed foods competitive with that of imported foods. And we have to really be mindful of our messaging and marketing healthy nutritious foods, um, including them being a part of a holistic approach so that people feel that all aspects of wellness are being considered. We also have to consider when we talk about childhood obesity in particular and look at interventions for children that interventions around increasing childhood consumption of healthy local produce should have a heavy emphasis on exposing children to healthy local produce in as many settings as possible, along with enough information to allow them to start making healthy choices from a young age. So thank you very much. I encourage you to eat local, but eat healthy. And we, I would like to thank our research partners throughout UE and the Ministries of Health and Education and Agriculture in St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Jamaica. And this work was carried out with the aid of a grant from the IDRC in Canada. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Murphy, for sharing with us uh, some consumer perspectives on diets. Uh, and notably in the, in the Caribbean, uh, we recognize some constraints uh, in terms of affordability uh, accessibility uh, and marketing. Um, we also recognize, uh, particularly at the youth level, um, perspectives on their feeling of invincibility. And I noted uh, some key issues as well, uh, the role of family meals and probably how we have lost that over uh, the generations. I also noted a, a very um, important comment here on whether or not in comparison, while we push for local, uh, can we guarantee that local uh, is healthy? And I think that has, to be, that has to come out as part of our overall discussion. Uh, most importantly, though, I think I want to chime your, your, your phrase here, that um, cost and convenience seems to override knowledge. Uh, and it's a very important consideration, I think, for all of us here uh, and, and going forward pertaining to uh, our own uh, food systems, how we address uh, that very, very key issue of uh, ensuring that healthy foods are affordable to our most uh, marginalized. So once again, thank you so very much, Dr. Murphy, for sharing with us. And I'm sure uh, there'll be lots of questions in, uh, the, in regards to your presentation. Now we want to move on to uh, one of two of our private stakeholders who are gonna share with us some of their perspectives and insights. First, and first of all, we have Mr. David Neelands. And uh, Mr. Neelands is a former British Foreign Service Officer an advertising executive. He joined Supercenter Limited as a marketing manager in 1985. He became the driving force for many enterprising initiatives, including the conceptualization of the long running Run For Your Money TV program. He was appointed marketing director of the company in 1993 and managing director in 2001, a post he held until his retirement in 2013. He has served on a number of boards, the NCD Commission, National Initiative of Service Excellence, Senior VP of the Barbados Chamber of Commerce, and currently the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Barbados, the Massey Foundation, and the Barbados Sugar Industry. So it is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Neelands, who will provide some perspectives on private sector solutions to create demand for healthy eating. Mr. Neelands, please, the floor is yours. Sorry, I'm muted. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, I uh, would like to start um, with um, a reference to the fact that I cleaned my teeth this morning um, with Colgate toothpaste. Um, and I found to my chagrin that it is no longer white, it is now black. I carried on because of trust. Change is upon us. Can we trust the food we produce the same way? Can we trust each other to produce more of it? Can we work together? 
You're all familiar with this slide, I think. This speaks to the FAO's four pillars of, four, of food security, availability, access, utilization, and stability. I have my own four pillars, which match, I believe, the same circle of life. Move, feed, breathe, and grow. So let's go to move. CARICOM governments have a goal of a 25% reduction in imported food by 2025. Do we have the capacity to produce what we reduce? Does the private sector have the appetite to help MSMEs to create solutions that result in healthy food products regionally and for export further afield? Who is the private sector? And now to access and feed. Supply does not guarantee food security. We need to reduce poverty by increasing incomes through helping communities to produce affordable healthy food, which in turn allows for growth in the economy for all people. We need to create affordable food with a greater focus on market and price. Utilization, breathing, we need to do it the right way. We need common standards. We need front of package labeling. We need traceability. We need to reduce predial larceny. In short, we need to trust one another. Private sector, governments, NGOs, all. Stability, growth. The climate is changing. We need to be adaptable. We need technical solutions to ensure we can produce consistently, to innovate, to share what we have in a region. We need consistent intra-island shipping by air and by sea. We need to understand that coming out of COVID, things have been happening. A wonderful example of what works when we work together. Slow Foods Barbados is a non-for-profit, but has shown that chefs and farmers can unite to create a more sustainable food secure island while supporting our communities. They have created slow soups, a concept that recognized that during our lockdown, there were many people who lost their primary source of income and indeed are still recovering as we make our way out of the pandemic. Senior citizens, disabled persons, significant numbers of unemployed folks in need of a healthy, nutritious meal. In the first instance, farmers who were unable to sell their produce made significant donations and chefs gave up their free time to work in borrowed spaces to create the soups. Joined by service organizations, volunteers, corporate sponsors and private donors working together to fulfill a need. And you can see them on the slide, the number of people that were involved in this exercise. The project continues and has expanded to the point that farmers who have been suffering diminished sales with restaurants and hotels closed are now finding new markets helping to build food sustainability. Could this charitable effort become a viable business producing branded, affordable and healthy fresh food, supporting farming communities and cooperatives and helping farmers to invest in developing more arable land deploying technology to build agro-processing initiatives and further develop the stability we need in the region. FAO, AICA, and the University of the West Indies are all playing a role to open the doors. Helen's Daughters, the solution project promoting women's empowerment through social change, should, I suggest, create their own food brands as well as others across the region who need to develop a market. These examples of innovative food solutions at community level deserve the attention of big private sector and other stakeholders to build distribution networks, develop retail spaces and establish groundwork for greater research and development. This is how it works. Quite clearly, it's about everybody being involved from beginning to end. It's about a continuum. It's about community. It's about getting back to community. Solutions 
come in all shapes and sizes to design. So design strategist Anya Ayam Chi and social entrepreneur Julie Avey from the Massey Group created Nudge Caribbean, a social enterprise connecting makers to the marketplace. Supported by Massey with initial expenditure of US $1 million, the program speaks to the need to support entrepreneurial energy, to stimulate the economy, create employment, and to nudge small and medium-sized business in the direction of success, both locally and internationally, working to build channels and market accessibility, working together. So in conclusion, do we have the capacity to produce more healthy food in the Caribbean region? Can the private sector, from farmers to chefs and entrepreneurs to big business, work together and move, feed, breathe, grow by reacting to stimuli, the stimuli that COVID has brought on us? It's only a matter of trust. I believe our next speaker, Jody White, will answer these questions. Yes, we can. Thank you so very much, Mr. Nealon, for sharing with us uh, your particular perspectives and that of uh, private initiatives uh, surrounding uh, the dimensions of food and nutrition security. Uh, I noted very um, importantly the uh, framework of building back better after COVID, and most importantly, through partnerships and trust. And I also recognize very embedded in there the importance of e-technology uh, in supporting these initiatives. We are thankful for you for sharing that with our um, attendees and certainly uh, look forward to further engagement. Next up, we have Mr. Jody White. And uh, Jody White is an award-winning entrepreneur based out of Trinidad in the fitness and food industry. He is well known for developing creative healthy twist on local meals. His most popular item is the production of pastas from regionally grown root crops. In particular, these products have become popular in overseas markets with customers that have specialty diets. Let me welcome Mr. White to share the experience of 10 years as a healthy food innovator. Mr. White, please, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, my apologies. I had to switch to my cell phone because my internet connection just went down. Um, so I'm gonna tell you my story. I am 34 years old and at the age of 20, I got a job as a pharmaceutical brand manager. And I managed many of the drugs that would have gone for NCDs, people who are hypertensive, diabetics. And there's one thing that I always found was that people would say, my sugar is high, I'm taking a tablet. You know, my pressure is high, I'm taking a tablet. And I never found that there was enough emphasis that was placed on preventative measures or controlling of the conditions that people had through healthier lifestyles. And I, that was just always lacking. And it was always in the back of my head. And, you know, I left that job and I opened a company that was called Slim Down 360. And yes, the focus was pretty much weight loss, but it was really weight loss through healthier means and proper scientific based advice. So we would offer people the proper advice as it relates to nutrition, to exercise. But what we found was that people are busy. People don't have the time to cook the things that they should cook. So we actually would provide people the meals that they need, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks. And that became the company. We would give you everything Coupled with the advice, if you had specific illnesses, we will work with your nutritionist or dietitian. We have people who assist you with exercise. And the company started and it did well. One thing I always found was that people would spend the first half of their lives sacrificing their health for their wealth. And the second half of their lives sacrificing their wealth for their health. People did not understand the relationship between their lifestyles and in future, the diseases that could, they could be infected with. And even to this day, I realize that people don't know 
how slowly things pretty much creep up on you. So we work with people all the time. Um, I've done many things. I've had multiple newspaper columns. I've posted shows on TV for a couple of years, fitness related. And most recently, the thing that I do is that I create ingredients that go onto the shelves of supermarkets or into restaurants from local produce, but are designed to be a little healthier. So the one thing that I do that I'm most famous for, I would say that I make part or we make pasta that's made from sweet potato and I presented this to the Minister of Agriculture about four or five years ago and um, the thing is is that they said nobody would ever eat a sweet potato unless it's boiled there's a significant lack of expanding the ways that we could use local ingredients change the way we do things and it's a challenge that I still face now and people that we deal with, we're accustomed eating potatoes as fries, baked or fried. They can't con you know, have the concept of saying, well, we could use local sweet potatoes. Or even if they want to use sweet potatoes, they're accustomed with the imported versions that are high in sugar. And some time ago, I dealt with the school's nutrition program. It's meals that are given by the government to school kids. And they said, you know what? We are going to stop giving kids soft drinks. And the parents were upset because they started giving kids water with their meals. And parents said, listen, you're giving our kids jail food. You're giving them water to drink with their food. They feel this is jail. So there's a, there is a lack of knowledge of people really understanding what is healthy food and what food could do for you and how food can make you feel. And it's through constant, constant, constant education that we have to show people. A couple of years ago, I personally financed a drive in Trinidad that didn't get very far because COVID actually hit. Um, it was called Trinbago Goes on a Diet. And Trinbago Goes on a Diet, yes, it was weight loss again, but it was really just to build a hype. We wanted to give people free knowledge from doctors, from nutritionists and dietitians, from personal trainers, from physiotherapists to change their lifestyle and to lose weight. And the goal was that people would go on, get a whole bunch of information, and it would be tied into local agriculture. So chefs and nutritionists would come together. They would make up meals. They would list recipes on there using local ingredients. And you could cook it at home and incorporate it into your, into your lifestyle. And then if you want to get personalized attention, here is a list of nutritionists in Trinidad. Go and talk to them and get your specific advice. And you know, that was supposed to be people logging on onto this website and just putting in how much weight you lost. And in the end, I hoped that we would have seen maybe Trinidad or the region losing cumulatively a million pounds. It was something that was hard to finance by myself, but it is something I would still like to do and get off the ground. It's a massive effort. But, you know, part of that was that we started filming a television show and I started going out to people and actually filming people who are diabetic. And you would see people who would have lost their limbs, lost their eyesight. And it's just that when they were younger, they did not realize how dangerous these things could be and how preventable these things could be. And I would really think that as a Caribbean people, we are becoming more and more educated. You would find that more and more people have access to proper information because there is still a lot of bad information. And it's battling that is a very, very hard thing. you know. People thinking that my life should change in a bottle or in a pill and not thinking that, you know, your life could change pretty easily by just cutting back on your portions and cooking more vegetables. You don't have to eat broccoli. You could eat string beans. You could eat patchoy. You could eat these things that you could grow in your garden. And we feel that local Caribbean foods are inferior. One of the things I do is that whenever we create something, it must be that I get the fresh produce from the farms and I could see the entire production process and I present it as minimally processed to a consumer. And it's not always easily accepted and it does truthfully cost more. And it does cost more because my scale is small. But as I grow, I continuously lower my prices. We continuously add in technology to reduce it. 
So we found that we've got the pastas that we do from cassava, which is regular pasta just made from cassava. We found that we brought it into about 40% higher than the price of regular pasta. But again, it's not that 40% sounds high, but a bag of regular pasta in Trinidad sells for a dollar US. And a bag of our pasta might sell for a dollar fifty US. It's not that bad still. I mean, when you think about it, a lot of people could still afford it. So just to close, uh, you know, I just like to say that, I mean, us starting here is a very good start. And I really hope that the support is given to the people who are actively trying to make the change and make the difference, because I think that information is always good and it could have a very positive impact. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you so very much, Mr. White, for sharing with us a very innovative and I, I am entrepreneurial um, uh, some feedback, you know, for in, in that perspective. Uh, we noted uh, some preventative approaches uh, that are not necessarily the norm when we treat our NCDs, you know, um, in that regards versus, um, I guess, you know, uh, what we typically see, which is the treatment of symptoms. And, and you know it has. We have to ask ourselves and and consider um, the objective of our uh, large pharma companies pertaining to these types of things, and and what is our role as well as stakeholders uh, in, in this entire process. You know, I was happy to hear you know of the need, obviously, for us to appreciate alternative ways to prepare our local foods. You know, and the um the uh, examples that even with your own entrepreneurial activities that you are. Uh, um, displaying public knowledge and attitudes regarding healthy foods uh, seems to be a key uh, limitation for us to engage uh, a little better and, and, and ensure a little more adoption of some of these practices. And, and I noted something that as well, you know, uh, is analogous to our COVID uh, situation. Uh, it's a problem as well for our uh, general public to distill the amount of available information that is out there to ensure that they're getting good accurate and reliable information that will help them make these kinds of decisions towards uh, a healthier lifestyle. Um, participants, I want to again remind you, please keep sending us uh, your questions and comments in the chat and in the Q&A uh, feature. Uh, very soon we will have a Q&A segment where we will address a lot of those, but please, you can continue to engage uh, in discussions uh, within uh, the chat. So once again, let me thank uh, Mr. White, uh, for this particular presentation. Now, our engagement continues, but with a very short uh, and impactful visual element. The private sector can be a crucial ally in efforts to make agri-food systems more resilient and sustainable to ensure healthy diets for everyone. Transformative change requires everyone getting involved. The project initiated a social media campaign to highlight businesses in the region involved in such healthy innovations. Persons shared names, photos, and videos of healthy, delicious local foods made using diverse local vegetables, fruits, legumes, herbs, and unlimited use of healthy oils. We have put together a short video from posts on Instagram and Facebook, and we are happy to have you take a look. So please sit back and enjoy this video presentation.
wonderful. We know the region is blessed with wonderful, healthy foods. If you want to see more, please check out the FFA as well as our fan social media pages. And it is not too late to tell us about your favorite local healthy food places and products. Use the hashtags, hashtag give me healthy, hashtag give me local. We will place some of the key links in the chat uh, so that you all can engage with us further on this wonderful uh, initiative. We have a very, a very important segment coming up, feedback from the youth. So we will turn to our three youth activists who will briefly share some thoughts, feedback, and takeaway messages and solutions as the data suggests that unhealthy food and nutrition habits disproportionately affects this particular group. So first I would like to invite Mr. Jared Spencer. And Mr. Spencer is a graduate from the University of Nottingham with an integrated MSc in food science and nutrition. And he is the incoming technical systems coordinator at the Addo Food Group in the UK. His academic interests are the study of novel sustainable food systems and consumer behavior change within the food industry. Jared has been a youth advocate with the Healthy Caribbean Coalition since 2019, and is keen on creating an enabling environment which allows for the access of safe, nutritious, and affordable food for all. Mr. Spencer, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, it is so great to see the public and private sector and civil society coming together to find meaningful solutions towards achieving a sustainable food system. It is also so encouraging to see these entities recognize for the first time that the goal of healthy, sustainable food cannot be achieved without the inclusion of a fourth group, the youth. I've been very lucky to have been surrounded by some of the most brilliant and innovative young minds that this region has ever seen. And oftentimes I ask them, what kind of Caribbean community do they want to inherit? And time and time again, at the top of their list is a Caribbean region that is not plagued by non-communicable diseases and that has access to safe, nutritious and affordable food for all. So my message to the private sector and to the food manufacturing industry today is this. The next generation of consumers will be the most informed and the most ethical to date. We want to know what's in our food, where it was made, and most importantly, at what expense to our environment. Let this represent a unique opportunity for businesses in the Caribbean, not only to broaden the demographic of their products to include a growing cohort of health conscious consumers, but an opportunity to implement bold and exciting, uh, bold and exciting ideas like circular economic models and corporate social responsibility schemes, all aimed at making food production as efficient and as equitable as possible. Food that is sustainable and food that is lucrative are not mutually exclusive, and the youth are committed to finding solutions to make food good for business and good for the environment. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Jared, for sharing with us your thoughts. I'd like to move on to Ms. Charity Dublin. And Ms. Dublin is an Antiguan-based nutritionist. She holds a BSc in Nutrition and Dietetics from the University of the Southern Caribbean and is pursuing an MSc in Public Health Nutrition from the University of Technology in Jamaica. She's certified in facilitating chronic disease self-management programs Oh, she's certified in facilitating chronic disease self-management programs by Stanford University. She's currently employed as a community nutrition officer in the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment, and is passionate about the areas of infant and young child feeding and the prevention and management of non-communicable diseases. She creates nutrition and wellness content on social media under the brand, Your Caribbean Nutritionist. So please, let us all welcome Ms. Dublin. The floor is yours. 
Good afternoon. I am absolutely delighted to be one of the youth voices on this webinar. The presentations have been absolutely thought provoking. One of the greatest takeaway points It seems we are having a little bit of challenge, uh, technical challenges with Ms. Dublin. Uh, so what we will do, we will move on to our next presenter and hopefully, uh, oh, there she is. Uh, you just broke up a little bit. Yeah, it seems that we are having some technical. Ms. Dublin, we're having a little bit of technical challenge. So can you just um, start over for us again? And I no. suggest that she takes oh, off the video. Yes, and now thank you so very much. You could probably um, just take off your video and we will proceed. Okay, you're hearing me clearly now? Yes, we're hearing you. Yes, we are. Fantastic. <laughs> so from the top, I am absolutely delighted to be one of the youth voices on this webinar. The presentations have been thought provoking. One of the greatest takeaway points for me is the need for partnerships with the private sector to help achieve a diet that is sustainable for humans and the planet. As a nutritionist working in the low income communities, I am happy to see emphasis placed on ensuring that these healthy, sustainable foods are accessible and affordable to individuals from all walks of life. It's easy to say eat healthy, but it's crucial that we put the systems in place to make this a reality for everyone. We want to create consumer demand for healthy local options while making those options the easier choice for all. It's also important to explore what food security and producing our own food looks like for countries and communities that have a limited agricultural capacity. I truly think that grassroots movements and youth engagement plays a critical role in promoting healthy, sustainable diets and lifestyles across the region. Thank you. Thank you so very much uh, for sharing with us uh, your thoughts uh, on the youth involvement uh, in healthy diets within the region, Ms. Dublin. So lastly, we have, lastly, we have Mr. Christopher Laurie. And he's a Barbadian medical anthropolog anthropologist supporting several organizations with, healthy, with health advocacy and research. His focus includes psychosocial determinants of health, issues of inequality and inequity and the protection and empowerment of vulnerable communities. His main work is with the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Barbados, advocating for policies to address childhood obesity. In this role, Christopher is responsible for coordinating a youth advocate group to support this campaign, developing monitoring and evaluation procedures, as well as preparing data to enhance the campaign's advocacy and public health education. Christopher also supports the Improving Household Nutrition Security and Public Health in the, Caribbean, in the CARICOM Project in St. Kitts, facilitating research for a food and nutrition intervention. So let me kindly welcome Mr. Laurie. The floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Yudoxi, for that introduction. Um, I would just like to initially mirror the sentiments of Charity and Jared, absolutely in pushing towards um, a more integrated and systematic approach towards um, health, food, nutrition, and equity. Um, and I particularly stress on the latter point because we do understand that um, within our small economies, our, our relatively small economies, it, uh, it is hard to obtain and maintain these healthy diets, which we keep striving for. But having said that, they're not unattainable. I was greatly encouraged by Mr. White and his interventions in Trinidad. And I would encourage all, um, all territories, all Caribbean territories and further to adopt such measures. In Barbados, we do have a coalition of civil society organizations who since the beginning of 2019 have actively been in pursuit of addressing childhood obesity prevention. Um, it's a large part of the work that I do at the Heart and Stroke Foundation, where we do have a number of youth advocates involved. And actually, Jared is one of these persons. And it is about growing a youth sensitization 
towards what health means, what nutrition means, and how to have um, active efforts and changes within your personal lifestyles. Um, I also, uh, we also work with the Heart and Stroke Foundation across um, a number of schools in Barbados to make sure that the messaging is consistent and that our changes are realistic and manageable and attainable. As part of my intervention on the FAN project in St. Kitts, we were, we were looking at a nutrition intervention and one of the key findings which um, we did ascertain was that difference in eating patterns that Dr. Murphy would have alluded to previously. And I particularly want to highlight the aspect of the differences in how adults and kids eat because adults will pick their food choices based off of cost and affordability and convenience, these grab and go measures versus kids that tend to gravitate towards items which appeal to their taste and texture. So understanding that as part of our interventions, as part of these reformulations, changing in the consistency and quality of our foods, we also have to take on board. But we do have to have these conversations in conjunction with our kids who we ultimately want to have these impacts on so having that continued dialogue with youth and younger persons is, in, is essential and quintessential towards making these changes happen. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Christopher, for sharing those perspectives. And um, coming out of uh, the three um, presenters and the feedback that they were able uh, to provide us, uh, we clearly recognize that the youth are asking for an integrated approach um, that uh, involves all stakeholders, including some uh, of those that are marginalized to be part of our health initiatives and more so our healthy diet initiatives. And so we want to recognize that um, going forward. Participants, I know your knowledge palette has been wetted and you were fully engaged in active and very active on our chat and Q&A platforms. The upcoming segment is dedicated to addressing some of your comments, concerns, questions, perspectives on the topic, and to engage further discussions with our panelists. But we encourage you to continue to submit your questions and we will try to address as many as uh, time allows. So if possible, I could probably ask our uh, panelists uh, to um, get ready. They could put on their videos and I will move into our Q&A uh, segment uh, in that regard. And a number of questions have been coming in. So I will try to touch on as many of them, as I said, as time allows. Very early on, we had a question that asks how are communities uh, to be involved in raising awareness on sustainable nutrition? And I'll probably, and we'll kind of ask um, our panelists to probably uh, try to keep your, your responses um, concise uh, so that we can get multiple persons speaking on a, on a particular question and as well as much uh, questions in as possible. So probably I'll phrase that question to Professor Samuels and to Dr. Murphy. Professor Samuels, uh, you muted? I, uh, oh, yes, and, and I'm going to hand it straight over to Dr. Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, no, Dr. The Murphy. <laughs> You know, there's so many ways that communities can be can be engaged and involved. And I think, you know, the initiatives that are currently ongoing, things like backyard gardening, community interventions around gardening, um, and really things like farmers markets. I think Mr. Nealon's um, mentioned a few different community uh, interventions in his presentation. So I think there are lots of creative and out of the box um, things that we can consider as well. And the education can be part and parcel of those things. I think for me, farmers markets are one of the best ways to go is when you have communities that are creating and producing that they can actually um, sell and butter their, their produce close to home um, and also use that as an opportunity to educate each other on, on what's good and what's healthy and nutritious. Thanks so very much uh, for that response. And, and we're gonna continue uh, with some of the other questions. A question came in asking as an agro-processor, how do we gain access to this type of data? And, would, and how would that data help us innovate suitable food products for market? You know, probably a think tank, the, uh, the um, participant was suggesting where we can work together to shape future, a uh, health future and healthy heritage of our Caribbean population. So I'm gonna again throw that out uh, to either one of our academics. Yes, thank you very much. 
I, you know, I'm really encouraged by this webinar because, and especially about what the Dean said in his introductory remarks about the importance of faculties of food and agriculture looking to nutrition. And I'm thinking that perhaps the, the, the faculty of food and agriculture in Trinidad is ideally placed to do exactly what is being requested here, to, to be the, the transition point where, and to be a place where manufacturers can come and you can help them with reformulating or with rethinking what they're doing or with education and so on. So what we can start with, for example, is making the presentations that we did today available um, as well as our own contacts. And you know, if a manufacturer somewhere wants to talk to Dr. Murphy or myself or whoever, just get in touch and we can take it from there. Thank you so very much uh, for that response. Wonderful, and it seems, uh, Prof, you're giving uh, the faculty uh, some homework. <laughs> so certainly we will, and I can guarantee you that, yes, we will uh, move to ensure that we address that. Wonderful. And uh, there's a question here, we'll probably um, target it to our private stakeholders. Uh, can there be higher taxes on the big fast food chains for the purpose of this type of research that is so vitally needed in providing data? So what are, what are your thoughts on that? Probably uh, Mr. Neelands, uh, Mr. White. Uh, if not, we will we will also ask our uh, academics as well. You know what? Um, the one thing is that the fast food chains do not necessarily want to develop anything that's local or anything that's healthy unless their arms are twisted. And we've had many interactions with a lot of the local ones. Um, it always boils down to one thing, which is profit margin and nothing else. And um, it, it has to start, I think, with pressure from the governments. It may not even be taxations, it may just be open discussions and letting them know that the benefits of it. Um, but something needs to be done as it relates to that because uh, you know it just has to be presented to the population in different ways that alternatives are there. Um, and I think it will continue to grow. So that's something I think needs to happen. Thanks for your perspectives there. Uh, Mr. Nilan or any other panelists yes, want I, to chime I, in? I, I would like to uh, concur with what Jody just said. Um, you know, the biggest traffic jam on the road at the moment is to the fast food outlets. When we came out of COVID, you couldn't get along the street because of so many people queuing up to join the queue. But the fact is, there are many things we can do, and Jody has spoken to them. His cassava pasta product is a, a concrete example of what we could be doing. For example, one of the major food items in Barbados that we like to eat, or people like to eat as culturally, is a macaroni pie. How good is that for you? Not very good, but if it was made, if the macaroni was made with cassava, it would be an entirely different prospect. We could take foods that people like to eat that were generally unhealthy for you and make them healthier. Cassava in itself, I think, is a fundamental product that needs to be expanded. One of the biggest wheat, uh, one of the biggest imports of food in the Caribbean is wheat flour to make bread. Why, oh, why are we not making more bread with cassava? We play around with it. There's not enough link between the farmer and the factory in terms of cooperation. There is not enough consolidation among farmers themselves to come together in cooperatives and say, in our community, we're good at cassava. We can help the local bakery to change things around. We can make it different. We've got to get into discussion and, and the government have to be involved in that as well and the private sector too. But it's about finding happy mediums. When you see the examples, Jody's product, there's another lady here in Barbados who's just been making product from breadfruit, um, all kinds of numbers but her main market is likely to be international because it's been positioning, uh, it's positioned as speciality food. We refer to it in Jody's case to some degree as well, but we need to take some of those speciality items and ingredients like cassava and make them into plain ordinary food that can circle around the Caribbean as well. There's room for both and we must support innovation, but we've got to get to the point that so much of our problem with health, in my estimation, is because we have people who are on the poverty line. 
and it's become more and more of that situation since COVID, since the economics of the world, everything about moving food around, it is a critical situation. If we can't find food for people in the local community that is easy to make, that is agro-processed, then we're hunting in the wrong market. And I think there's many more things we can do. Thank you so very much for sharing uh, your thoughts uh, on that. And I think yeah, I am all resonate with um, your perspectives there. So moving on, and I think that question will be probably posed to um, Dr. Murphy and Professor Samuels. Parents like myself struggle to create exciting meals from local produce, pleasing to children who are influenced obviously by friends and who share fast food with them and even the fast food ads that captivate them. Where can we find more recipes from a local produce pleasing to children? I'm going to pass that over to Professor <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> no problem. Wonderful. Fair yes, Prof. <laughs> well, first of all, I think that um, the internet is a great source if you are careful and you know where you are searching. There are lots of sites that talk about healthy food, healthy eating, you know, um, trying to, I remember even one site talked about, you know, using um, um, vegetables to make the gravy that you serve to the children. So if you're doing like stewed chicken, you, you put tomatoes and pumpkin and mash it out to make the gravy. So, so there are, there are ways and, and there are things to do. But I think, um, you know, we have to be very realistic in terms of recognizing the impact of marketing by big food and big soda. If you look at the change in our eating habits over the past decades um, and, and how it, it has been driven. And just to circle back to the question before that talked a little bit about taxation. I know that we all would like to think that education alone or you know education is it's important we need to educate people but as maddie said a lot of people already know what uh, that they are eating unhealthy i think that price and fiscal measures personally i think that's the way to go if it were up to me i would tax french fries 50 percent because you know you can just pay down on your heart attack you're gonna get the heart attack from the french fries in 10 years so start saving the money from now the government can put it down and, and start building on that money. There are some foods that are not only obesogenic, but are actually dangerous to your health. And I think those foods should be taxed heavily. That will change the construct of when you're going to buy, you know, convenient and cheap. Well, these unhealthy foods should not be cheap. Thanks, thanks for that perspective as well uh, in, in how we may approach that, at least from a national or, or, or regional level. Uh, but as I think uh, Mr. Leland said, it really requires uh, some conversation and trust among various stakeholders for us uh, to address that. So there's a very interesting um, question uh, with a very nice uh, prelude from St. Vincent and the Grenadine, you know, where they're speaking to the fact that the uh, society and economy now has been devastated by natural hazards and the imports now, uh, obviously what they have to depend on you know, and, and the question really speaks to, and again, I think it's right there for, for your Professor Samuels and Dr. Murphy. You know, how do we begin to address, you know, the taste and nutrition transition? You know, what processes or approaches are there for us to try to uh, facilitate that, particularly when sometimes we are, um, have stress factors outside our, of our own doing, external factors. So if you could uh, uh, attend to that, it would be very nice. Thank you. Yes, it is true. Whenever you have a disaster, be it hurricane, volcano, whatever, the fresh food goes away and the tin foods are what you have to eat. And, and that's reality. I think one of the things that we need to do in the Caribbean is have standards for front graphic front of package labels. Because give you an example, the other day I went into a supermarket to buy whole wheat crackers because of my background, I looked at the back to see trans fat labels. Most people wouldn't do that, but I looked. One of the crackers had 8% trans fat and the other one had zero. But the two of them are side by side on the counter and the average person doesn't know which one is the more, is the more unhealthy one. So I think even 
in the circumstance where you have um, foods that are packaged and that you need to, to, to choose one of them because agriculture is down because of hurricane. We need labels to tell us which of those foods are healthier and which and which have on these labels that say if you're high in salt, high in trans fat, we shouldn't have trans fat in our food system at all. It has no nutritional value. We need to remove it. Thank you so very much for that. And reminding our attendees of the importance of ensuring that we uh, peruse our labels and um, the available information, they use it to the best, uh, even within restricted circumstances. I have a question for Mr. Oh, sorry, sorry, Dr. Murphy, you wanted to, to, to go ahead? I think I did see this comment. I think it was about the barrel culture is what was- That's right, yes, yes, please. It's, really, really, it's, a, it's a really good example and point because we do have a huge barrel culture in the Caribbean and we get lots of our imported food through that way as well that come to families. It's an area I think that we need to do a little bit more research in. We haven't done a whole lot. And I think it's quite, in, it's something that we need to, to learn more about, about what people get and, and what they, they get out of it as well. One of the other things I wanted to mention is that um, a big piece of this also relies on our regional trade um, or lack thereof. Um, and I think, you know, if we can find ways to increase our regional trade, that will help us in terms of probably cutting down on some of these issues when it comes to, you know, the barrel culture or even, you know, the, the high imports of foods that sometimes people don't even really want to eat um when it comes to disasters because a lot of times you know people mean well and they send foods um and it's not even appropriate culturally sometimes in terms of what people um uh, are sending so there this this actually came up in some of our interviews especially with with um you know people within government and some of the food manufacturers and and distributors because they're saying when you have a natural disaster they're looking at the ports how are they going to get foods in and then what kind of foods so i think that that trade piece is really important as well uh, and thanks for bringing that up, uh, Dr. Murphy. It has been something on, on CARICOM's list for a long time, and we really hope that we can get some progress uh, in that area. It's, it's truly an area that uh, can seek to, uh, as you rightfully said, revolutionize our ability uh, to have um, regional, the healthy foods uh, throughout uh, the Caribbean. Excellent contribution. Thank you so very much. So moving on, uh, Mr. Nilan, there's a specific question here to you. Um, where it asks, do you think that there is a role for chefs to be involved in addressing NCDs? And if yes, how uh, would that role unfold? And if Absolutely. no, uh, why not? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the example that I was using with Slow Foods in Barbados speaks exactly to that. The soups that they were producing were from vegetables, from different pieces of food that had been you know, not being consumed, that were edible and healthy and nutritious. There are a number of innovative, clever chefs in the Caribbean, all over the place. There's one in Jamaica that Dr. Alafia can speak to, who's been working from New York to try to encourage the um, production of school foods in a community uh, where agriculture speaks to specific uh, products, be it sweet potato, be it yam, be it whatever, in this region. Um, something else, peas and beans in another region, so that people can actually produce in their own locales. At the end of the day, yes, we must look at the importation of food and the taxes we pay, but we've got to make it cheaper to produce the local foods. And when I say the local foods, I mean agro-processed foods. I mean, Taking a yam and a sweet potato and asking somebody to cut it anymore is, you know, old dog. We've got to get out of that. We've got to make the stir fries pre-packaged, ready to go, properly labeled, everything under one roof. There's an example uh, in Guyana where because of the vastness of the country and Georgetown being quite away from rural uh, farming communities, a number of people have come together in a group built a, 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 a commune of farmers who supply them with vegetables, which they cut and shape and prepackage and chill and sell to, to retail. So, so there are all kinds of ways. And I think the youth will lead us. I think there are a lot of innovative chefs who are supplying foods to hotels and restaurants and coming out of COVID, a number have actually started up their own businesses, delivering food. One, of, uh, one young lady I met, uh, the Healthy Caribbean Coalition's recent um, program was a lady called Rennie Thomas 
from Grenada, and she produces granola from sweet potato, nutmeg, and chocolate. The chocolate factory is, a, is pulled together by a cooperative of farmers growing cocoa. It's all there for us to do. And this girl is, uh, did her degree in public health and can see that the way forward is for people to work together. The youth will lead us. There's no question about it if we, if we listen to them, you know? Thanks for, thanks for sharing that. And as you mentioned youth, I think I'm going to pose the next uh, question to our uh, youth panelists and get their feedback and, and all of you all can uh, respond. What can be done to leverage interest of millennials in creating spin-off businesses in healthy local food products, services and promotions in the region? So we wanna get your feedback uh, with regards to what can be done or what needs to be done uh, to uh, improve or leverage on that interest uh, in uh, these uh, healthy food products and businesses. So any of you all, feel free uh, to, to chime in and um, share your perspectives. I think that's a great question. And I think that there isn't much that needs to be done to create that interest. I think that interest is already there. What needs to be done is the support and the access to resources and things like that. I think that my generation recognizes the importance of sustainable food systems. And we recognize that, you know, as it stands, 70% of our food is imported. Uh, the current model for food, it's, I think that COVID has made it abundantly clear that it's simply quite literally not sustainable. So there is the interest there. Um, as Mr. Nielsen was saying, we have some really exciting, innovative young people doing incredible things and incredible ideas. And all that they're asking for is an opportunity. So I think you need to listen to the youth and see how both the public sector, the research uh, sector, can support them and lift them up so that they can make their ideas uh, realities. Thank you so very, very much, uh, Jared, for sharing your thoughts on that. Interesting thoughts that an enabling environment is very important uh, in supporting uh, youth engagement. Uh, Christopher, Charity, and any feedback from you all? Hi. Um, yes, thank you for that. So I would definitely um, agree with Jared, and I think that at the grassroots level that kind of innovation is extremely important. Um, I think that young people, especially we operate in different spaces. So whereas um, understanding that traditional market um, of the quote unquote older persons and where they operate and um, how they trade, et cetera, it's going to be different for us. So we tend to operate more in the digital space on social media and those spaces are extremely important. Um, of recent in Barbados, we actually had a huge traction whereby the youth advocates, which I saw a comment in the chat function, um, of what is the value of youth advocacy? We were actually able to leverage the Ministry of Education to have a pledge to address the school environment where they're actually going to implement a school nutrition policy coming into this new academic year and onwards. And we're actively working with them towards how that is shaped. So I think that the more and more you can have those kinds of interventions and collaborations, it has to be a participatory approach um, whereby policymakers understand that the youth are ultimately who are going to be affected by these changes. And the more that they are able to shape them, the better. And it goes back to Dr. Um, Professor Samuel's point, whereby it has to be these overarching policy decisions because if you are trying to make a healthy um, change in your personal life within an environment that does not support that, can you facilitate? Can you make that choice? The answer is simply no. So the more that we are able to shape the environment with the guidance from the, the technocrats, but you have to have the input of the youth so that they have the support and they actively buy into what you're trying to achieve. Thank you so very much. And well said and noted. Ms. Dublin, anything from you? Okay, then uh, we will move on. And, and participants, we know that um, we are at already 3.30 and uh, it definitely seems that our webinar is one uh, that was well received with, um, and very uh, important to you all with regards to the level of interaction. 
uh, we will entertain, uh, at least in this live version, one last question. Uh, afterwards, we will proceed to our uh, wrap up. And I want to direct this particular question uh, to Mr. White. And the question asks, or it says, manufacturers may say that it is cheaper to import goods and products than to buy local, such as our cassava flour. What strategies can we implement to assist with a cheap, sustain, cheap, sustainable, and healthy diets to consumers? So probably you could further elaborate on your own experience. Mr. White? So, you know, um, a big problem I have in Trinidad is that cassava flour has a 12.5% vat on it, and regular flour does not. And while we have appealed to like the Ministry of Agriculture saying, listen, at least put us on a level playing field to that extent. It's viewed as a luxury item. So they do not want to remove the VAT from it. Um, cassava flour in this part of the world is about three times more expensive as cassava flour from Asia. And even Africa, it's, it's 20 times cheaper than what we get here. Now scale, is one big thing that we could utilize. Two, I constantly have to give people new recipes on how to use it. Because of course, the cooking techniques are a bit different. People try to use cassava flour like they would use wheat flour and get poor results. So we constantly have to teach people how to go ahead and use it and to expect that it is not going to taste and feel the same way as wheat flour would. The two commodities are totally different. If you grow up eating a cassava pancake, you would say that wheat-based pancakes taste weird. So it's really getting people to understand that, hey, this is different. I accept it will be different and it's better for me. And I am willing to give up that little bit of what I would prefer for something that is healthier. And us as producers in turn would be able to scale up and get costs down to consumers. Well, so, thanks so very much for sharing that. And, and what I, I gathered from that was the key need to have uh, the entire uh, food system value chain uh, embedded in, in our approach. You know, uh, I noted the importance of having different recipes, and I saw how that linked with uh, the importance of chefs, you know, being uh, integrated there, uh, the importance of farmers and ensuring productivity is high, you know, and it really speaks that uh, there's still a lot that we need to do. And we're very thankful uh, for you for sharing uh, those perspectives. Participants, at this time, it is my pleasure to invite our UE SDA Faculty of Food and Agriculture Webinar Committee Chairperson, Dr. Lystra Fletcher Paul, uh, to provide a session wrap up and a summary uh, of recommendations. Dr. Fletcher Paul, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Eudoxy, and good afternoon, everybody. And I have to say, I have this has been a very engaging. Um, webinar. I have really thoroughly enjoyed it, especially because of the contribution and looking on at the um, what I'm seeing in the question and answer. It's so good to see the youth so involved. So without further ado, um, the main recommendations coming out of today's um, webinar, I have sort of some broad headlines and key, what I call notes that that spoke to me coming out of the recommendations. One was partnerships, partnerships to help to encourage healthy, accessible, affordable food. Partnerships with the private sector and not just any private sector, but with friendly pr private sector, people who are already making money by growing and producing and selling healthy, nutritious food. Partnerships with the youth, because they are the voice of the future. In fact, um, at the national dialogue that was held for the food systems, um, for preparing Trinidad and Tobago's paper for the food systems um, summit, one of the, the key recommendations was that the youth, the demand for healthy, nutritious food must come from the youth. It must be led by the youth because they are the future of the Caribbean. So if we want this to be sustainable, we have to get them on board. So partnership with the youth. Another key, um, two other key words that stuck out to me, what I call keywords, information and education. 
information for the consumers in terms of warning labels and nutrition labels. Dr. Samuels talked about, Professor Samuels talked about the importance of having the front of product labels so that you can see immediately whether this particular food item has what is good for you and what is not good for you. The use of um, information in terms of what constitutes healthy food, what constitutes a, a healthy plate. She spoke about the plate having one half with salad, another quarter with the meat, and another quarter with um, your vegetables. Education at all levels, where the messages must be consistent, constant, and targeted. In other words, when Maddie made her, her, her presentation, she was saying, well, yes, they tell you about this in the school feeding program or in school about eating healthily, but when you go home, you don't get healthy food. Or when you sit at the table, people don't eat healthy, healthily. Or when you get bigger, or people say, well, the, the kids say, well, you know, that they, they see eating healthy as, as a punishment because it was not brought up, the, the whole idea of eating food was seen as something that is not it is being imposed on them. So the, the education is a very important part of that whole recommendation of how we present the messaging and it must be targeted. Targeted not only at, 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 at different audiences, it's not a general thing. I remember the, um, the Secretary General of CARICOM Secretariat used to say, sent doesn't necessarily mean received. Because you send out these broad messages doesn't necessarily mean that a lot of people or everybody is going to get it. So it must be targeted, special messages targeted to the youth, special me messages to the school feeding program, special me messages to medical doctors. I know one of my, my doctors, my cardiologist, when I said to him, listen, when he said to me, you know, your, your, your um, cholesterol is a bit high. And I said, well, is there any way I could change it with diet? He said, no, 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 no. You have to take this medicine. Otherwise, you will die of a heart attack. So he's telling me right away, the first point of, 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 of um, defense is go to the medicine. So we have to educate our medical doctors. I know they're in the process. That's why it's called medicine, because they want to sell medicine. They're, they're linked with the medical, the, the big pharma and so on. But we need to get them on board to say, you need to say, let us eat properly as well. So um, targeted messages to our chefs to get them involved in the preparation of food. Targeted messages to the grassroots. Um, the charity made that point, the involvement of grassroots, because sometimes the messaging is coming from youth who are highly educated, who went to all these top universities, and that turns off a certain, a certain demographic of people. So we must be able to target to the people that we want to accept the message. We must create the demand and it must be led by youth, and we must say that it is, it is also preventive. The other thing about education is that there's also need for communication. Communication um, suggests that the dialogue is both ways. We must not only send the message, but we must also receive the message. What is the private sector saying why they are not in get, getting involved? What is the fast food group saying why they are not getting involved? We must listen so that we can change the narrative and see how we can ad, um, adapt and adopt to, to understand their needs, their, their challenges, and how we can address the challenges. So the communication must be both ways, and there must be innovative channels of communication. We spoke about the need for farmers' markets and backyard gardens and community gardens that are creative and new, so that the private sector is also getting involved and using the local ingredients. We spoke about the importance of the, the Faculty of Agriculture and our research institutions in terms of innovation, another key word that came up, innovation in terms of taking specialty, making specialty items to substitute for what is currently being used. I remember, for example, when I was working in Guyana, the Carnegie School of, of um, Home, um, School Econ um, what is it? Home Economics had a training session for people who manage tuck shops in the secondary schools of Guyana, teaching them new ways of substituting imported foods for local foods without changing the taste. And they, taste, they tested it with the use of students. Um, so the Faculty of Agriculture is an important means of that transition so that we can get them involved and they become the go-to place for manufacturers, for the private sector, for individuals to come for information on this new nutrition because we're going to be pushing more the nutritional aspect, the food aspect. 
in innovation in terms of prepackaged, processed, and local foods, new ways of processing the food. And then there are the policies in terms of that governments can do. So there's the price and fiscal measures. Alafia talked about tax, taxing and um, the imported unhealthy foods and removal of VAT. Mr. Um, White talked about the need for removal of VAT, for example, on, uh, on the cassava flour. So, and then there's the need for more regional trade in nutrition sensitive foods. We spoke about the barrel culture, but I remember growing up, we used to get barrels from Grenada and St. Vincent with good food, blue food, um, cassava, dashin, um, sweet potato, all the healthy, nutritious food that is very good for us. So let's encourage the regional barrel food, but it's healthy and nutritious and providing the enabling environment. The next um, key, key point here, an enabling environment that supports access to information that provides incentives, especially for the young people to get involved in the, in the processing of food, um, the shifting to this culture of new food. And um, community. Mr. Neelands talked about the importance of building that community where you have the private sector involved in building trust because it's only by the dialogue and the community working together that we understand one another and we build that trust that is required to make the shift that we are seeking. So those are the key recommendations coming out of the discussions. There may have been more, and I'm sorry for those, I, you know, time has sort of, um, I know we are limited for time, but these are the key recommendations that I have so far. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fletcher Paul, for sharing with us uh, some key recommendations uh, from this uh, particular uh, webinar. And I would like to concur uh, that this was certainly one of the most engaging webinars uh, that I have been part of. Uh, and it clearly reflects the importance of this topic and certainly the need for a follow-up. So I'm putting that out there to our host institutions. Firstly, let me thank you, the viewers, participants, attendees for staying the course. We have had a very insightful and informative session on healthy diets in a regional context, utilizing local foods. The scope and diversity of our discussions surely will allow us to build on our foundation and propel us to explore very specific opportunities as articulated by Dr. Fletcher Paul. I ask that you continue to engage, not only with the STA FFA of UE, but also uh, with FAN uh, project to follow up on any of the presentations and specific options presented. Additionally, I would like to request the host institution to please follow up on any unanswered questions, as you know, our time was limited, uh, and to please follow up through their platforms to provide responses to those questions. I wish to express deepest thanks to the organizers, particularly the staff involved in the preparation and delivery uh, of this particular webinar, all the presenters, and importantly, our participants. It was a pleasure to take you through this session, and I look forward to you, your continued support as we transition to healthy diets. I ask everyone to please remain safe, take care, and goodbye. <laughs>